Firing chain is armed, house suppression water system is armed. taken. But um, welcome everybody to this hof, which I'm sure will be a very interesting talk. Uh, and welcome to the hub. To those of you who haven't been here before, the hub is uh, an international network of co-working spaces and platforms for social innovation, sustainability, and all things related to that. So it's a place where we try to create an environment for people to come together at events, uh, during the day, to exchange ideas, be inspired, and work together. Um, you can come for events and see them at the hub.pk or it's also possible to come and use it as a flexible working space. There's a few of our office members here tonight as well um, and you can check that out at the hub.pk as well. <laughs> but that's enough promotion. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Douglas, which will give a, a very interesting talk now. So um, we look forward to it. And to those who are just arriving in the back, there are several seats down here who are free. So, welcome Douglas. <laughs> There are seats up front, so I, I'm patient. If you guys want to meander your way, don't feel like the outcast, like, oh god, I'm gonna be that guy's gonna walk all the way up to the front. <laughs> I can't do anything. Don't worry about it, it's cool. But we will have you on camera. Yes, <laughs> it will be on YouTube forever. <laughs> <Is> that guy? <laughs> Alright. So let me give you a little background on myself. Uh, again, my name is Douglas Millett. I am currently the CEO of Cybernated Farm Systems, a company I just started a few months ago with the lofty goal of nothing less than solving the global hunger crisis once and for all using 21st century technical innovation and not resorting back to 17th century old school agricultural practices. It doesn't work so well. I'm a former space shuttle systems engineer. I used to work with a subcontracted company to Boeing in Houston, Texas. And I'm also the author of Turning Point, a layman's guide to why space exploration and development matters to your everyday life. Sadly, more people know about Lindsay Lohan than they do about how well the space exploration and space industry has advanced their quality of life on a daily basis. So I decided to write a book that kind of sums it up and gives people a better perspective and also a greater respect for what space exploration actually means. So what are we going to talk about today? <clears throat> well, we're going to tell a little story. And the story is basically about space exploration and sustainability. How are these two things interconnected? Why are they interconnected? And why does it matter? There will be a quiz at the end. No, just sustainability in space increases sustainability on the Earth. It's not like the technologies we develop for space exploration stay in orbit. Those ideas, those processes, those capabilities come back down. And we can use those on the Earth, amongst ourselves, to make the world a much better place if we afford ourselves the capability to do it. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to build a Mars base. Now, the Apollo program when it first started was not supposed to be just a one shot to the moon, put a flag, yay, and then everybody come home. It was supposed to be a moon base with orbital platforms. It was a whole gigantic program and process that was set up. And part of that process includes how in the world do you have people live on a place that's not designed for people to live? To what level of technical advancement do you need to integrate into the system? How do you provide for their biological needs? How do you provide for their quality of life needs? That way, they're not spending their entire time just maintaining their habitat, but instead they're actually doing the science and the research that they're supposed to be there for in the first place. Okay? So what are some of the biological needs, and these are pretty simple, I'm sure they come up, they always come really quick, that the human being as a creature needs to survive? Anybody can throw one out. Food. Air. Air. I heard food. Yes. Well, uh, Water. Water. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. So what about quality of life necessities? Things that go beyond just keeping the creature alive, but makes the creature comfortable. Shelter. Shelter. Energy. Energy. Light. Light. Time control systems, which kind of goes in with energy, but yes. Okay. Clothing. Clothing, right? Especially around here. <laughs> I am from Orlando, Florida. This is a big difference. So you guys have it in mind. You, you know what you know what's going on. So you put a bunch of scientists and engineers and techno geeks together in a room and you say, okay, how in the world are we going to provide all of this for astronauts on Mars or on the moon or somewhere else in the International Space Station? which is what's going on every single day, is that wonderful piece of technical know-how circles the planet every 90 minutes. So you've got air, food, water, sleep, medical care. Sleep and medical care, most people don't think about right off the bat when they're talking about biological need, but if you really think about it, they're kind of important. Sleep deprivation can have some serious biological impacts negatively. And medical care, well, if you get broke, you gotta get fixed. Um, and so, especially if you're on another world, or a space station, or something like that, it's not like there's a hospital down the street. So, the systems that you put inside your base are going to have to be as robust as possible. They're going to have to be as efficient as possible. You can't afford to have something break. And so, with that level of sustainability in mind, that's where space exploration and sustainability go together. Quality of life needs. Now the first one on Mars is actually kind of a biological need. You can't just go for a brisk morning stroll in the Martian air. You can do that on the Earth. You can live on the Earth without shelter, but shelter makes life a little bit more comfortable. It allows you to control climate control so if it's cold, you can keep yourself where you want to be. Clothing, education, energy, transportation, and communication to highlight some of the prime ones. Now, education, most people don't think about, but the smarter you are about how the world operates, how to engage each other in a civilized manner, increases your quality of life. So that is some of, that those are some of the requirements that go into how would you let astronauts live in such an environment. But it goes beyond just how will they live. Because that word right there means a lot in space. <coughs> Abundance is by far one of the most important words, not just for space exploration, but also for peaceful existence on this planet. I'm going to take all of you and I'm going to put you on a deserted island. And I'm going to give you one coconut tree. And that's the only food source you've got. Now I'm pretty sure most of you will stand up and say that you're very well-behaved, honorable people who are not prone to violence. How long do you think you would last in that mindset on a deserted island with one coconut tree amongst all of you? Environmental conditions drastically shape, positive or negative, our behavioral characteristics. Now, if I put the same group of people on an island with 500 coconut trees, what do you think the odds are that you're going to fight over coconuts? probably going to play sports with them or something, you're going to have so many of them. 
So abundance, having more than enough, is essential for creating an environment that allows us to behave well with each other. And when it comes to space exploration, it's vitally important on say, a Mars base to have not 100% of what you need, you need 125% of what you need, 150% of what you need. Why? Because there's no Walmart down the street for you to go shopping if you run out of something, or any grocery store chain. Everything in space exploration is, has much larger logistics windows, two years to send something there and back. You can't afford to run out, people will die. Well, actually, that same scenario applies back here on the Earth. If there's not enough of something, people can die. Same philosophies, different environment, but if you look at the way we operate the planet today, we don't really do it that way, do we? Now in space, we have technical abundance. What that basically means is we put all of our bells and whistles and innovations together in a way that we can pr produce the most of what we need with the smallest amount of human labor input. Why? Well, because the astronauts are not there to just maintain their habitat. They're there to go do stuff, to pursue their passion. What is their passion? To be scientists, to be explorers, to go out into the Martian soil and drive around in a cool little go-kart and dig up a bunch of dirt and see if there's life there. Things like that. Likewise on the moon. Not so much life, but other things. So on a Mars base, technical abundance is vitally necessary. The same can be said back here. Now, you go back 50,000 years ago to the hunter-gatherers that populated this planet. They lived in a paradigm of natural abundance. Really, really big planet, not a whole lot of them. So they were able to basically use the planet as they wanted and not suffer any negative ramifications because they're not having a big ecological impact. They would use a spot and then move on to the next spot. And a couple of cycles later, where they were once before, would end up going back just fine. Natural abundance. When you start looking at populations in the billions, nature's kind of going, yeah, time out. I'm kind of having a hard time keeping up with you people. And we see that happen on the planet all over the place. Fortunately, we've got pretty good brains, most of us. And so we've invented ways that basically puts nature on a higher level and allows our technical systems to use natural practices to create technical abundance. So now we're going to look back here on the Earth a little bit. And we're going to look at some of the technologies that exist in today's world right now. And I do have a source sheet that lists every single piece of technology that I'm talking about. As a scientist engineer person, I never say anything without being able to prove it. And so if anybody wants access to that, I did not print them because why waste the paper? I can just send you an email. So you can fill out a list, give me your email address, and I will send it to you. I blind copy everybody. Nobody will see your email addresses, and I have no interest in spamming, spamming you. I'm too damn busy. <laughs> On the earth, we have air. Well, as long as we don't muck it up, the Earth does a pretty good job of providing that one for us. And we all recognize, for the most part, that you know we need to do things a lot cleaner when it comes with regards to air and pollutions and things like that. The same can be said about this one. Water. Likewise, the Earth has a lot. We figured out really neat and innovative ways to take the ocean and turn it into drinking water and things like that, using desalinization systems, etc., etc. And then we have some really amazing new discoveries and new technologies like carbon, uh, like portable nano mesh, carbon fiber nano mesh materials. Basically, you can take a bottle, as such, empty, go to the dirtiest mud hole in Africa, run the filter through, and you can drink the water on the other side instantly. It filters out all the muck because bacteria can't get through that nano. The scale's too small. Water particles can but the muck can't. Now imagine having a really large system like that that can clean up all the water for an entire village or a region or a city. Biological needs going on to food, high-tech farming, aquaponics, hydroponics are starting to become a lot better known as far as their potentials and their capabilities. The 
big CFS icon is my company that I just recently started. To give it to you in a nutshell, I'm going to be able to feed 1,600 people 10 different fruits and vegetables each using just a 464 square meter building that is completely off the grid, solar and wind powered with a battery bank backup. In other words, I can drop this thing in the middle of nowhere with no infrastructure and it will make food. That's quite advantageous to all those people starving to death in Africa who have no infrastructure. That's kind of the point of my company. To get these systems into places where they're dying and they don't have the means to advance themselves by themselves to this level. Now it's not just drop food and walk away. There's also an educational platform involved. We're going to teach these people exactly how this building works to respect the tech that goes into it. We don't do a lot of tech respect these days. People just use these bells and whistles. They don't have the foggiest clue how any of them work. But the people that are going to have their lives saved from these buildings are going to understand how these systems work. And they're really not that complicated. They can be explained with manuals and tutorials and a constant process of getting these people upgraded, not only in the belly, but in the brain. What you do is the doctor sticks his head in a video game system. It's kind of what it looks like a little bit. He grabs these controls and he starts playing with them. And what this does is this allows a surgeon to perform surgeries at a dr dramatically increased precision level than you can with nubby human fingers. The incisions are small. The recovery times of the patients are on order of 50 to 75% faster than normal. Not only that, you can do it telerobotically. In other words, he doesn't even have to be in the same room. He doesn't have to be in the same city. He doesn't have to be in the same country. So imagine getting these systems in a mobile platform so that a surgeon anywhere on the planet or within range could basically use the internet and our advanced communication systems to save lives in places where they don't have hospitals. Now, what about tech for our quality of life? I got to know Contour Crafting and Dr. Kushnievis. He's a professor at the University of Southern California. He came up with this really cute system, and I got to know it because of Haiti. How many of you obviously remember the Haitian earthquake a couple of years ago? People are still living in tents. What century are we living in? They're still in tents. So what does this do? Well, this is a big robot that can build a 2,000 square foot house in 24 hours. Or, what was that, 185 square meter? house in 24 hours, including plumbing, including electrical. It's a fully automated house builder. And it's on wheels, and the materials that he's invented, you can see them here on the right, basically stack layer these buildings. And because he's a civil engineer, he works with mechanical engineers and everything else, they've made this material property, this special concrete, that is tremendously stronger than what we currently have. And so it's perfectly safe and viable. There's only one thing preventing him from building a full-scale prototype to actually fully detail out all the bells and whistles. What do you think that restriction might be? Money. 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 <laughs> Lots of capability, not a lot of finance. That's kind of dumb. <laughs> Clothing and other products. Automated sewing systems. Imagine the height of independence. Instead of settling for what another clothing manufacturer says, this is the latest trend and you should buy this whizzy widget or whatever kind of clothing item is out, you take a little bit of this top and a little bit of this bottom and you customize it to your size specifically because not everyone is just a small, medium, large, or whatever. And you send this to a local facility down the street that custom creates in the colors you want, and the fabrics that you want, and the style that you want, instantly on demand, prints out your clothes or sews your clothes and sends it to you. Or 3D printing. Now I have, I forgot to take it out of my bag. 3D printing is the ability to rapidly prototype 
pretty solid and robust things, and complex things with threads, and complex things like full-scale models, or complex models, in a couple of hours. Basically what you can do is you can put in a blueprint of a particular design, <coughs> and these 3D printing systems will, in a short period of time, create what was once a drawing in just a couple of hours. And the more complicated the object, the longer it takes for it to do it. But for those of you who do get my, uh, my source sheet, the video that I've linked, it will show you that it can create some very <coughs> complicated parts out of one, one run, one move. It's all out of one piece. Gear systems that interconnect, you spin one and there's like 20 of them connected in a ring and it'll make them all move. And they're all perfectly interconnected. It can do very complicated geometry. If anybody wants to see these afterwards, you're more than welcome to come up and bang on. So imagine having the capability, and this will be really advantageous on Mars, to have some of the basic stuff or materials that you need to create whatever you need, and when a part breaks or something goes askew, you just rapidly print one out really fast and you replace it. <coughs> Say something breaks in your house, you do the same thing. Say you want to customize and make your own dishes, <coughs> do it. Because it really works just like a printer. It has two cartridges. Some of them have three or four cartridges of different colors. And you literally put this cartridge of stuff in, kind of like ink, but instead of ink, it like, like contour crafting builds the house in layers, it builds this stuff in layers. And they are getting a lot better with this. They now have 3D printing systems that can do titanium really complicated. I have pictures. You guys wouldn't be able to see them. I don't want everybody to have to rush up. So you can come and see the pictures of some of the titanium designs that they've made using 3D printing. Education. We live in a pretty dynamic world. And in this particular case, education and communication go hand in hand. We have the ability to learn anything, anywhere, almost any time. Thanks to the internet, for the most part. But we're also coming to realize that the traditional, traditional mode of education, the industrial factory line process of kid goes into grade one and just goes through the motions until they graduate at the end. Congratulations, you're now a cog in the wheel, go get a job. <laughs> Not exactly the most stimulating way to educate children. In fact, quite the opposite, it stifles a lot of creativity in children. So a lot of leading experts are starting to figure out that the brain doesn't quite work that way. And that we need to adopt more dynamic, organic, interactive modes of learning. Not based on how old someone is, by saying, oh, you're this age, you're only allowed to learn this. But by cultivating a natural passion in them for whatever they want, and try to throw the other stuff in there as they go. And as different kids learn in different ways. A six-year-old might be really interested in art and not care about math. But by the time they get 11 or 12, maybe they flipped and are more interested in math and not so much in the arts. So things change, passions, passions change. I'll give you an example of how dynamic education is. I have an eight-year-old daughter, she just turned eight. When she was six and a half, almost seven, I put her on a website that I learned about called Khan Academy, K-H-A-N academy.org developed by a guy by the name of Salman Khan. It is a really cool self-directed learning platform. So we put her on the math bit. Right now it's mostly the hard sciences and math and they're trying to figure out how to get history and English and other disciplines to fall into this dynamic learning platform. But consider it a tree. And you start off at the top, one plus one is two. That's addition one. So you go through the real basics. Every module has like a 10 minute video. And there's jokes and stuff like that. It's not all uber serious of some authority figure in front of the room. In fact, you don't even see anybody. All you hear is the voice and you see the light pen writing on the board. So it kind of gets a little bit away from this I'm the boss, you listen to me mentality. And it's more, I'm your friend instructing you, let's just go along. So we put her on that, gave her some of the basics on how to navigate the website. It's a perfectly safe website, so we didn't have a problem with her doing her own thing. Two months later, 
She's doing it like 30 minutes every other day. She comes up to me and she goes, Dad, I'm having problems with the word. And I'm like, you're doing math. What are you doing with words? She goes, what's obtuse? And I'm like, obtuse? You mean obtuse? Yeah. And she runs off. Obtuse. As in obtuse, acute, right angle, trigonometry related words. So I walk over there and I look over and I go, what are you doing? And she goes, all this. That's exactly what she was teaching herself. She had already passed radians and degrees. So she had already gone through the lesson and separated the difference between radians and degrees. And the moment she passed this, she was going to start getting into sines, cosines, and tangents. And how, and Pythagorean theorem and things like that. She's six and a half. <laughs> All right? Why? Because nobody told her she couldn't learn that. Or that she shouldn't learn that. And they're now starting to use the Khan Academy in schools in California. Well, what they've basically done is they turned the teacher more into a referee instead of a teacher. The teacher just kind of goes around the room. There's all these modules and stations. And they are Khan Academy programs on. And the kids are allowed to collaborate, cooperate, and help each other learn. And they have found eighth graders that are now doing differential equations and calculus three because they can. Education is not what we are told education is. And this notion that we need to just throw more money at it is obviously a failed ideology to begin with. But it goes deeper than that. We need to change the way we teach people. Clean energy systems. Now, a lot of people know about these, so we're just going to touch base on some of them real quick. We know about solar, and they're getting better and better with <coughs> solar. In fact, there was a recent article as of the 19th, I think, of this month, where they have figured out a way to use carbon nanotubes as collecting systems over the solar cells so that you don't waste as much energy due to heat and it doesn't absorb it. And they're getting orders of magnitude better in efficiency just by turning them. They used to be flat. They turned them into cylinders and it drastically improved the efficiency of the solar cells. And not too long before that, they invented a solar cell that could work at night. <laughs> collects moonlight, ambient light, and it also collects <coughs> thermal, heat, things like that. Which is not part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And if it's going to be there anyway, you might as well tap it. And so they figured out ways to do that. Then you've got wind. Now, when most people think about wind, they think about big, giant fans sucking up hundreds of acres in these big wind farms. Those in and of themselves have their own issues. I mean, any, any fan of that size is it's spinning around. You've got gravity pulling down. It's causing the nose of that thing to lean forward. And a lot of the gears on the top end of those fans end up wearing out really fast, which is why they shut down or break down or they have constant maintenance cycles. Because gravity is not your friend when you're leaning that way. Now they're trying to lean them back and they put little angles on them, but gravity is still pulling down on these big fans. So why don't you do that? A vertical wind turbine that's symmetrical relative to gravity, so it doesn't matter what gravity is doing because you're not leaning that way, you're leaning, well you're not leaning at all, you're up. Now let's go a step further. Inside these bearing housings right here, instead of actually gears and bearings, let's put two magnets of the same pole. What happens when you try to put two magnets together the same pole? They don't want it. Well, if you set up the housing the right way, you'll have your entire fan floating on a magnetic field, which means you can, and it'll move. The cut-in wind speeds are drastically less on magnetic vertical <coughs> axis wind turbines. So you take these, and they also make a lot less noise. And it doesn't matter which direction the wind is blowing. You don't have to turn the fan to face the wind because the way these, these things are set up, thanks to aerodynamics and good old-fashioned physics, it doesn't matter which way the wind is going, even if it changes direction, it still spins. I recently went to Christiania the other day, and we were eating a, what was it, a shawarma? Whatever it was called? A uh, Turkish burrito. <laughs> up there and it's just 
doing its thing, going around like crazy. It's not like you guys don't have a shortage of wind in this place. <laughs> My nose knows it. Now, how about this one right here? Let's put some vertical wind turbines built into the light poles. And that way, when a car goes by, what does it do? Generate a big gust of wind. So you force the waves to go around just by having the traffic. The traffic can be the driver. Now, if you put a nice little battery bank in the bottom, just one good battery that can power these lights. And let's make the lights LEDs because they like they suck like maybe 10 watts of power for light the whole thing. <laughs> It's the wind. It's the wind. It probably is. <laughs> so now you have a system that's tremendously more efficient. The wind's going to blow anyway, and when the cars go by, you can accelerate the charge of the battery so that at night it can run the entire thing all night long, and it's not plugged into a grid. In other words, if the local power plant goes down, this doesn't care because they're all independently powered. Now let's take this a step further. What if every single building in the entire city was independently powered? Decentralize the grid structure. We have a very centralized power system right now. You have one or two power plants, a bunch of relay stations, and if something happens drastically, I don't know, ask Japan, <laughs> what happens? All hell breaks loose, breaks loose, everything goes down. But if every single building has a little bit of solar, a little bit of wind, a little bit of geothermal if it's capable, a little bit of wave, a little bit of tidal, you start using all these natural energy generation capabilities, not holistically, we're not looking for cold fusion here. There's not one holy grail power source that's gonna do everything all the time in one shot. We might get there one day, sure, but we're not there now. However, we don't really need it because we have a whole lot of clean energy systems that can be used together so that buildings can be off the grid in and of themselves. If the building is too big, then you have a house that nobody's in right now that's generating 160% of the energy that it needs because everything's off. If you have a smart grid with a quasi AI computer system that can in real time see where the energy loads are, it can shift power from that 160% building to one that may be short by 20 or 30 percent and do it instantly. It's called dynamic load balancing. Nature does this all the time. We can have our technical systems do the same thing. In fact, on the International Space Station, that's exactly what we do. We have dynamic load sharing. Clean energy systems continue. We have the bloom box, which is a fuel cell, an advanced fuel cell that is really powerful very efficient. Uh, currently eBay, the company eBay in California is running some Bloom servers to supplement its power needs. About 40% of its energy is coming off of this. And the primary ingredient is sand. <coughs> sand. There's a crap load of sand on the planet, so I don't think we really have a big shortage of making these fuel cells. Currently they're running on natural gas, but they are doing research to get them solar powered or electric powered, kind of like a self-electrical electrolysis built in. So imagine they get that up and running and they're really close to it. Now you have wind system. Power failure. There we go. That guy. Now he's hiding behind lockers. So imagine you take all these clean energy systems and you plug it into that fuel cell system, you have one hell of a robust, robust infrastructure for your power. We don't have to worry about energy. Now we have energy in abundance. And energy is the primary driver for the advancement of human civilization. Starting with rubbing two sticks together to make fire, we we'll probably saw a lightning bolt scare the hell out of them with a tree on fire. All the way to the technologically advanced systems that we have today. Transportation. How do we have abundant transportation? Well, there's a key question to ask yourself, and people who live in urban environments know this already. Do you really need to have a car, or do you really just want on-demand access to transport so you can go where you want, when you want? Now, people who live in New York, Stockholm, like that, have a, a really good mass transit system. I know that Copenhagen is currently digging one up right now and trying to expand the metro that you guys have. So if you have a really good mass transit system, you'll come to find that a lot of those people haven't owned a vehicle in years. Why? 
and they don't really need one. It's not about having a car, owning a car, it's about being able to get around. If you design things properly, like your city systems or your transportation systems, and you use advanced technologies like this, for example, Ultra, this is a fully automated, no driver, computer controlled car, for lack of a better term, that you hop in, punch where you want to go, and it'll run down this track almost like, think a uh, monorail at Disney. But instead of being on a rail, it has little tires and it drives around, and it's point to point like a taxi. It's not like a subway, subway where you have to wait for stops, but when you hop on, you tell them where you want to go and it takes you directly there. They're currently running this system at Heathrow Airport in the United Kingdom, and it's working rather well. It takes a little getting used to, but then again, any advancement that people aren't used to takes a little getting used to. <laughs> Electric cars. Now, I know there's all kinds of varieties, but I really, really like the sporty look. So you've got Tesla Motors, you've got Nissan with the Leaf, all these other options are coming out for electric vehicles. It's not so much that the electric vehicles aren't capable. I mean, yeah, can they go three, four hundred miles yet? No. But that doesn't matter so much if you have a good infrastructure. But we hear a lot of the political arguments and, and people who detract against electric vehicles, well, we just don't have the infrastructure for that. How, how's everybody going to charge everything? Did we have the infrastructure in place when I invented the internal combustion engine and started making cars? No. It's not like they said, no, we can't have the car yet. We've got to build a crap load of gas stations first. <laughs> then you can invent the car. That's not how it works. Likewise with the electric car. Unfortunately, billions and billions of dollars are made and lost on oil. And so if you start mucking with that system too much, you run into a big roadblock. But we have the capability. You've also got systems like this. This is from Stanford University. There's also the Google car. And I know that there is a company in Germany that I can never remember the name of that is also working on this. But it's a fully autonomous, remote con not even remote controlled, self-controlled car. No driver. And think about this. You're having a really good night out with the buds on a Saturday and you're absolutely loaded. How many traffic accidents and people die from being Superman trying to jump behind the wheel of a car like an idiot thinking they can take themselves home? When you could get on an app on your phone, and if you can see it, you may probably make the icon really big. <laughs> <laughs> Ask the car to come and get you. These remote taxis, for lack of a better term, can show up at any time, pick you up, and take you home. And since they're radar driven, GPS controlled, and they can track all the vehicles within, around them for like about a mile radius, and they can communicate with each other at light speeds using radio systems and everything else, they'll know what the other cars are doing, and the other cars know what it's doing, and the odds of you running into an accident are zero. And then we've got maglev trains, which Asia is really up on, for some reason, my country is completely retarded when it comes to that. <laughs> we are very married to our cars and airplanes. However, if you were to take something like this and really make a robust network around the entire planet of high-speed maglev trains, you could get around a lot easier than with an airplane. Trains can hold more people. It can be more comfortable. It can go almost as fast. And if you do something called ETT, which is evacuated tube transport, that's basically taking a car-sized vehicle, putting it in a tube, sucking half the air out, and you can go about 1,500 miles an hour. Because drag can be a pain in the butt as far as how fast you can go, which is why you run into issues with trains can't go too, too fast because they run into wind resistance all the air. But if you put it in a tube and you suck a lot of the air out, you can go a lot faster. Now you don't want to accelerate that quick, that might be uncomfortable. But you can get up to those velocities and then slowly come back down and you'll be able to go to New York to Hong Kong in about four to five hours. You basically just kind of cross over the North Pole a little bit and you kind of come back down. <laughs> ETT has an entire map laid out on how you could do a global grid of looping systems where these transports could take you anywhere you want to go and you can take a nap and wake up and be there anywhere in the world pretty much. So why don't we do that? 
That would be expensive, wouldn't it? Now, do we have the natural resources to do it? Yes. Do we have the technical capability to do it? Yes. Is the planet populated by enough science, techno, engineering geeks? Yes. Who would like to do that? But do we have the political or financial will to come close to making that happen? Getting access to the resources. <laughs> yeah. So, let's get on with this one. Communication. It's hard for us to argue against communication. I mean, you've got your tablet right there, and people have got their phones. And you, I Skype with my wife and daughter almost every single night. Go back 20 years and try to explain to someone that you're going to be able to hop on a laptop and do a live video conference and whenever you want, halfway around the planet. That then wasn't even conceivable, but now our communication capabilities are so strong that that is actually in our phone. They have Skype apps in the phone where you can go through your phone now. So that's not a problem. So we've got all these opportunities to create abundance in our ability to eat, have clean water, get around, communicate, have shelters that can be rapidly produced at a high state of safety for every man, woman, and child on the planet. We have the technical capabilities and the natural resources. So then there's a question. Can our current socioeconomic model actually handle that level of abundance, that level of sustainability? Was it ever designed to be that efficient? No. No, it wasn't. A lot of people forget that the economics that we have today were basically developed about mm, two to three thousand years ago. It really still boils down to markets and financial transactions. Now that started off as like seashells and coins. Or, first it was actually trade and barter, right? Two sheep for a cow, that kind of stuff. The world was a very big, complicated place. You really did have a have and a have not scenario where you couldn't grow or cultivate something on, a, on an abundance level, on a robust level. So some people became this particular occupation and some people became this particular occupation. And then they would trade their knowledge back and forth through goods and services or whatever. So that was perfectly viable way back then. We don't live in the same world anymore. We're not in that level of deficiency. We are living in a world of potential high efficiency if we actually did it. So, let's do a little breakdown. What do we have now? What do we need? Based on everything I just told you, and I just went over some of the really basics of the technologies that we have today that exist right now. None of that's sci-fi. None of that needs to be invented. All of that exists right now. We have a system based on scarcity, which was relevant when it was devised. What we need is a system based on technical abundance. In the market system, what happens if you flood the market with a particular widget or whatever? The value of that goes... Now, it might have a high intrinsic value, like food or something like that. People need it to live. It has a high value for us. But the market value can be highly messed with. And it can also be messed with artificially, which means I want to make sure the price stays at a certain level, and so we're going to destroy some food, i.e. the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1932 by the United States of America during the Great Depression. Lots of people starving, lots of food was out there and stored up, but they decided to can a lot of that food so they could maintain the market price. How asinine is that? <laughs> And trust me, America's not the only one that does stuff like this. Every country around the planet for hundreds of years have done that to maintain this artificial equilibrium that they think is relevant. So we have a system based on inefficient human labor as the main driver. What we need is a system based on efficient technical labor as the main driver. Now that makes a lot of sense, the human labor bit, when that's really all we had at the beginning. I mean, yeah, eventually we got a couple of box to pull the plow and things like that. And then we started developing tractors, which really started reducing how much human labor you needed to do farming. Just look at the agricultural sector, like how many people it employed a thousand years ago on the planet versus today. 
will look at the productive capability difference between a thousand years ago and today. We can produce a whole lot more with a lot less people. That's where the technical labor bit comes in. We've gotten really good at inventing systems that don't have emotions, they don't need to take a lunch break, they don't smoke cigarettes, they don't care who they're serving. My food systems don't care if you play Xbox all day or if you're a rocket scientist. It will make food all the time, indiscriminately, forever. As long as it's clean energy powered and is maintained properly. Now fortunately, there are enough techies out there that love that kind of stuff that would do it as a hobby if they, if they could. In fact, a lot of them do. They, there are how many people, there are plenty of people who have aquaponic and hydroponic farm systems in their own houses just because they like it. They think it's pretty cool. And there's a lot of people who tinker with robotics all the time because they like it. So now let's put those two people in a room and let them be the ones who they like doing it anyway. They're the ones who make sure that the buildings and the facilities were managed and upgraded and adjusted accordingly. We have a system based on cyclical consumption for constant growth. What we need is a system based on sustainability and balance. How many planet Earths do we have? <coughs> How in the hell can constant growth be the dominant model when you only have <coughs> one planet? Money. That's later. It doesn't work. We're going to run out of stuff. Now we're starting to see that happen, by the way. It's also about making a lot of redundant systems in this thing, because in this current system, because you've got to have cyclical consumption, which means how, how is GDP derived? You just got to sell a bunch of stuff. It's all about profits and bottom lines and getting a lot of merchandise out there. In other words, you can make a really, really good phone that lasts 150 years that costs way too much. Or you build a really, really crap farm so that the poor people can afford it. Now the resources, the natural resources that go into both of those phones is virtually identical. This one breaks really fast and people chuck it. Look at the waste. Just look at cell phones as a simple example. How much waste goes into making duplicate, less efficient, terrible versions of just that one product? And how many natural resources we waste on a regular basis just there? Now look at every other industry and how much product duplication and how much stratification we have in quality of product. If we actually set out with the purpose of sustainability and balance by making the highest quality version of every single thing possible based on current knowledge, and now if there's a big revelation that happens in 20 years, then you make sure that whatever you made is as recyclable and renewable as possible. That way, you minimize the resource impact on the products that you create, and you can actually make more products than we currently do now to satisfy the needs of everybody on the planet. We have a system based on ownership and control. What we need is one based on usership, which is a word I made up, and open access. Ownership makes sense if you go back to the time in which it was relevant. How did, all, how did ownership start? I mean, the hunter-gatherers didn't own. They actually lived in a usership and open access paradigm. They just kind of moved around and grabbed what they needed. They used the planet as they saw fit. They didn't have a big footprint on it, and the planet didn't care. The planet cares now. Or at least as far as our perspective is, it does. But when it comes to the agricultural revolution, now we have a scenario where you've got people who are tilling land and doing a lot of work on the dirt to grow food for this local region, and they don't want somebody that had nothing to do with it go into it because there is an emotional attachment to that labor. I worked hard for this farm. I don't want some schmuck coming in and taking all the food that I worked for, right? So I'm going to put a fence around it. I own this land. It is mine now. Somebody hops the fence, comes in, takes some stuff anyway, Peter Rabbit, takes off. All right, that wasn't enough, so now I'm going to hire a couple of guys with sticks. Now you have police and military influences to protect the ownership because of the human labor paradigm. <coughs> but I go back to the fact that my robots don't care about that. There is no emotional connection when you have technical abundance and technical capabilities 
because that computer, those technical systems, they don't have that emotional conflict. They'll make more than enough for everybody, no matter what you do all day. And that's where you get to usership and open access. That goes back to the do you need a car or do you just need to get around? That goes down to open access, things like Wikipedia, like Linux. Linux is one of the highest examples of open access, open source information sharing. It's who, who does not know what Linux is? All right, Linux is an operating system platform for your computer. Uh, yeah, Windows is one and Linux would be another one. Windows is proprietary, controlled, closed off, can't mess with it, gotta buy the next one when it comes out. Linux is open source, anybody can jump into the code, make it better, improve it, and it's free and downloadable for anybody who wants to use it, including all the software packages that it runs. Because this planet is populated by a lot of computer geeks who love to sit in front of code all day long, which would give me a migraine. <laughs> but they love doing it and they create amazing software packages that mimic or resemble the mainstream ones that you've got to buy. Now imagine them living in a world where all the people who spent their time on the proprietary ones also contributed, in fact I know some who do, but anyway, also contributed to the open source platforms so that everybody on the planet had access to the most up-to-date, capable, and upgraded systems possible. Linux is just one example. And that exists today. We have a system based on outdated, multi-century-old ideologies and institutions. I think I've hit that quite a few times. What we need is a system based on forward thinking, adaptation, and emergence. We're always learning new data, right? We get new information. The human species is constantly learning. The Earth is flat. I know it's flat. Look, if you go there, it's going to fall off the edge. A little bit of science, okay? Not so flat. Different new data, different way of thinking. Completely different look on how the world operates. Moving forward. There's no way you're ever going to get into space. Besides, it's flat up there too. Can't you see it's like this like big glass plane over us. Everything's about at the same spot. Just some of them are brighter than others. Alright? Tranquility base. The eagle has landed. Man on the moon. Okay. Yes, we can go into space. New data, new way of thinking about ourselves, our planet, the universe, especially that whole turn around, look back, and take a picture of the planet thing, which gave a whole lot of people a big wake up call. So we move forward, we adapt. But look at our socioeconomic systems. Has that adapted and changed? relative to new information and upgrades and new knowledge and capabilities. Not really. There might be tweaks here and there, but when you start getting to the levels of capability and abundance that we have today, it's falling apart. It shouldn't have to. There shouldn't be a man, woman, or child on this planet that suffers in any way unless they bring it on themselves because they went hiking and forgot to pack a rope. <laughs> but that's on them. What we have now is a system based on hostile competition, secrecy, and differential advantage. And what we need is something more akin to collaboration, cooperation, and information exchange for mutual benefit. That goes back to the internet. We're exchanging information all the time, and that's perfectly free. Now granted, some of the information is way off. <laughs> so you got to learn the filter, the nonsense, the BS from what's legitimate. When it comes to competition, I'm actually not anti-competition. It's not like everybody's going to sing Kumbaya around a campfire. Competition is okay. Two scientist friends or colleagues going up against each other to solve a particular problem is not really a bad thing in the long run, is it? Somebody's going to win. Somebody's going to solve that problem. The entire human species is going to benefit from it. And if these two scientists are ethical and educated the proper way, they'll congratulate each other and go have a beer after they're done. But economic competition kills people. Economic competition pulls resources from one area, from one group of people, over to another group of people. Ergo, starvation, 
then planet destruction, deforestation, yada, yada, yada. Economic competition is not really good. But don't take away my sports. Because at the end of the day, sports doesn't kill anybody. But that can. Secrecy and differential advantage, well, that just goes into the mine, I own it paradigm. Does it not? But if you're collaborating, imagine if every single scientist on the planet, or technical person, worked together, instead of building missiles, bombs, and guns, decided to increase the energy efficiency of every single city on the planet and or design better cities on the outskirts so that we have these really amazing productive capabilities all around the entire planet. It's not like we have a shortage of brain power. We just don't always use it in the right way. We have a system where political opinion, influenced by financial contributions, which we all know about, called lobbyists, dictate the ebb and flow of political operations, of global operations, to benefit a select few. Just ask the Occupy group how that one works. A system, what we need is a system where the scientific method is used in conjunction with human experience <coughs> and technical foundations to enhance the lives of all people. Now, this isn't some Terminator futuristic robots taking over the world thing. There is a human element involved. A lot of people ask about, what about AI? What about you get self-aware technology and robots that can think for themselves and they're almost human? Well, at that point, as far as I'm concerned, they are human. They should not be used as slave labor, and they should be treated just like everybody else. That would be the proper and ethical thing to do. But a dumb tech, what I call dumb tech, some robot machine that just cranks out something over and over again and doesn't have feelings or emotions or self-awareness, can be used in a way with human experience and advancing knowledge to produce enough for everybody on the planet. We need to move from an old system to a new one. I consider it like an upgrade. Right now we're, run, we're running Windows 1.0. And we need to upgrade to Linux. <laughs> we call it the resource-based economy. Before I knew what that term was, I just called it a Mars base. Because that's exactly how it would have to operate. And this has already been, this was figured out decades ago. It, it was under a different name, it was under a different premise. But if you apply all of those foundations back here on the planet, we can do it now. So that's a cute little name, RBE. But remember. There are no utopias. There's no such thing as perfect. We're not talking about a perfect world. We're just talking about a better one. Something that's much more efficient. It's better for more people. It actually takes into account everybody and kind of gets rid of these racial divides, religious divides, geographic divides. I was fortunate enough to be on the bowling team, or the bowling league, with the pilot of Space Shuttle Endeavor, which was actually my bird, that's the one that I was assigned to, the last mission. And he had been on previous missions before. And one of the things I asked him, and I asked several astronauts when I went around the, the space facility in Houston, what was one of the first things you thought when you got up there and you turned around and you looked back? To a T, every single one of them basically say, it's the most amazing sight I have ever seen in my entire life, and I wish every human on the planet could have this opportunity. And there are no lines on a map. You just see the Earth. You see land masses and water, and that's it. And you know down there are a whole bunch of animals and plants and creatures and people trying to make the best of it, but we're not exactly using the right systems anymore to make the best of it. We're simply going from an established society, which is what we have now, this is how it is, this is how it's always been, as if somewhere in a book it's written, God created heaven and the earth and money and banks. <laughs> which is obviously not true. To an emergent society which adapts and adjusts its capabilities based on what we've learned and when we reach a sufficient enough level where we can do something efficiently and sustainably, then we just go around the entire planet so everybody goes up one notch. So how in the world do you get from here to there? How do you go from this 
mess that we have today to something that's a lot more equitable for more people. I'm not going to tell anybody what to do. I'm not going to tell you to join this or join that. It doesn't matter. Here's what it boils down to. You could join a group that expresses ideas that resonate with you. That could be any one of the ones you see there on the list, and there are many more. Something I say quite frequently is it doesn't matter what flag you're flying on your ship. What matters is that your ship is going in the right direction. At the end of the day, if we're all docking at the same harbor, where mankind is a, a hell of a lot better off, then do it in whatever way works for you. Whether it's joining the Zeitgeist Movement, promoting and advocating the Venus Project, the Atlas Initiative Group is a group that's trying to actually build well, a test city, like an urban environment where you could go and visit like a theme park or a resort where you could experience life in that kind of technical abundant world, technically abundant world, where you actually don't pay for anything when you're in there because there's so much of it that there's no financial value anymore to everything that's there. It's just that efficient. You could start or work for CSR companies, corporately social responsible entities. That's what I'm doing. Basically, I'm tilling the soil. I'm going to be eroded from the bottom up. My goal is to make people less dependent on money for food. So now they got a little bit more money. Yay, got more money. I have lower bills. And then what happens when you do that with energy? Yay, don't have a bill for energy. More money. Now let's do that for transportation. Now let's do that for something else. Eventually, you're going to have no bills, a crap load of money, and you're going to be going WTF. What do I need this for? What's this paper mean anymore? My food's covered, my water's covered, I've got solar, rain collectors, I've got transport, I've got the, the things have been over time developed in a way where I don't need this artificial proxy anymore. I don't need this anymore. Because it's not about the paper, it's about the resources. We use the paper to get the resources. You can get rid of the middleman if you're efficient enough to get rid of the middleman. And there are many more options. In the long run, we're all one species. We set up a lot of divides amongst ourselves. But it still boils down to one fundamental truth. We only have one Earth. If we don't take care of it, we're going to have a really bad day. Now, the planet doesn't care. The planet will go on without us. In fact, in a couple of billion years, the sun's going to expand. It's going to suck into our solar system. Everything's going to get vaporized. And then the sun's going to go nova and blast all of us and our bits back into the universe as tiny little particles, which is where we started from in the first place. <laughs> That's kind of a big way of looking at it, isn't it? It kind of makes you feel... We are... So what we should do is make sure that this little brief period of time that we have is as good for as many people as possible and we start breaking down these old school divisions. Thank you. Vinci that you mentioned, uh, is that uh, like um, a result of uh, space exploration stuff or is there a Da Vinci type of thing up there somewhere? Currently the ISS, the space station, doesn't need a Da Vinci system up there because they rotate crew frequently enough and they, they have emergency backup rockets that can go save somebody because that's close, relatively close. But a Mars base, on the other hand, that would be a completely different animal, and so you would need something to go there that would work for that. Uh, da Vinci was actually, from what I understand, developed uh, kind of quasi for the military to be able to put these in combat zones so that if something happened, the, robot, uh, the doctor could be far away and still do surgeries. But then the commercial sector went, yeah, we could do a lot with that, and so they basically kind of took it, which is good, because that's a better use for it anyway. And, uh, and so that's really where the Vinci system came up. And it's already in the hospital, all throughout the various hospitals throughout the U.S. and stuff like that, so it works. Because you just got one here in Denmark. Oh, oh well, there you go. You got one in Denmark now. 
I did not know that. Just so yeah, I learned something new too. Uh, anybody else? Yes. I know I'll get to you. Your, uh, throughout the whole uh, lecture, I was thinking, where do we start? And uh, then you said, join these movements, and, and that's, of course, a start. But uh, there's a, I was just thinking about that s single moment where you have the abundance to get to there, mm -hmm. to say, now you don't have to pay for, for instance, energy, and now you don't have to pay for uh, transportation. Mm -hmm. So many of these uh, things will have to be collective as to work together, uh, for instance. To a point, yes. Many of these. And um, somebody will have to take a decision to, to go from one state to the other. I don't necessarily believe there needs to be a decision maker for that process, and here's why. Whereas, let's, let's look at kind of like communism and socialism, right? That was a top-down, we're going to make you behave, right? That was kind of like, all right, everybody be both good boys and girls, even though the infrastructure and the system wasn't really set up to make that happen. That's kind of like the authority saying, we're going to a new system, right? Obviously, that didn't work so well. What we're talking about is a ground up slow evolution, a change. It also changed people's behaviors and how they think about themselves and others as well. It's a kind of a slow process. I look at this as a generational issue. This is probably, I mean, if, if everybody really put their heads to it and really wanted to make it happen, I think it'd probably be a two or three generation flip over. But it would be slow. It's not like one moment somebody's going to say, all right, now everybody just do it. It's going to happen because eventually, Everybody's going to get off the grid energy-wise, and they're going to have that less bill. And what's going to happen is other people are going to see that, and they're going to be like, well, I want that too. So then they're going to mess with their politics and their structure and their system to make that happen. And then they're going to get off the grid. But it's going to be the people as a collective. It's, it's, yeah, it's a collective, but it's not somebody <coughs> telling them to be a collective. It's them wanting to be a collective. The human species is a communal species anyway. We don't do very well on our own for a very long period of time. In fact, it's kind of dangerous out there in the big bad world. And so what we do is we come together as social groups and, and that's how we function as a species. We kind of get away from that in today's current economics where every man is their own island and it's all about me and selfish self-interest to make the most money and, and all that kind of stuff. Whereas that which is counterintuitive to the communal aspect of, of ourselves that wants to come together and work with each other for mutual benefit. So you can't tell people to do it, but you can slowly make it happen over time, which is what I'm doing with my company, with the food issue, and I hope somebody else does an energy version, and somebody else does a water version, and we start peppering the planet with these entities, whether it's a humanitarian group, a nonprofit organization, an NGO, a CSR company, whatever formula works best with them, which is why I say I'm not telling anybody what to do. It depends on what you think you are best at and what would resonate best with you. Do that. As long as at the end of the day, your goal is to create that level of, bun of abundance for people so that they don't have to worry about those bills. And that's an organic process that's going to have to basically be, for lack of a better term, viral around the planet. And that's how I think we'd shift it over without somebody having to say, all right, now do this. I think eventually the people will say, do this. Yes? I'm thinking about uh, building a biodome and hopefully grow all year round. I don't know if it's possible. Do you think it's possible here in Denmark? Oh well, yeah, I think it's perfectly possible. Do you need heating, extra heating? You could, if it's made out of the right kind of glass, it'll trap a lot of the sunlight that'll come through. Now I know you guys have sunlight issues <laughs> during the winter time. Um, but they have, they have. Uh, Biodomes and stuff like that in the Arctic, when they do go up and do Arctic research and things like that, they figured out ways to make it happen. Um, you can climate control the facility using solar collecting panels. You can also do geothermal if you can find a geothermal access or vent. It depends on where you are and what's in your zone. Some things might not be practical based on geography. It really depends on what you have access to to warm that environment. It should be too expensive to, to build also. Depends on how fancy you get. I mean, it can be expensive, sure. Um, and that's where we run into that whole money versus capability issue. Do we have the capability to do it? Yeah, sure. Do you have the money to do it? Eh, probably not so much. It depends on to what level you want to take it. 
There are companies, though, that you can basically buy biogenomes. Um, I can't remember the name of it. There, there's a couple of them. But anyway, you can buy prefab biodomes, so you don't have to put a lot of grunt work and a lot of hard labor into it. You can just get this biodome and then it can be like, put together relatively easy. I don't mind building. I, I, I like to build that. Right. Well, that's good, too. I, mean, I think you have this kind of like Ikea, build your own dome. You know, there's uh, something to that effect. Uh, but I think it's perfectly possible. You're going to need time to make it happen. You'll just have to do the research on the best way to tap the thermal capabilities of your region. And that might be, that might include putting a lot of dirt around the outside edge as an insulating layer or something like that. Use the earth as your insulator. And to that effect, it all depends on to what level you're going to take. It could be possible. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Um, just looking at your own uh, company, Sabinated Farm Systems, um, are you expecting uh, any threats from outside entities to not make this happen? Yeah, Monsanto and kind of everything that yeah, exactly. themselves. <laughs> but, yeah, there must be a lot of power that so you must find out this way. Um, at first, my entire goal is just saving the third world starving people. Now, if they have a problem with that, then that's going to be a media blitz I will be happy to get into. You know? <laughs> um, but at first, I don't expect to be on their radar because I'm not in their market. I'm not planning on getting into their market at first. Eventually, the snowball will roll, and the avalanche will roll, and they're not going to have a damn choice. That's my goal. Do you know where in their third world you're going to start? I have connections in Kenya. Uh, with the Vice President and President of Kenya, and in Cambodia, and Indonesia, and India. Thanks to my going around and doing these kinds of things, I've met a lot of amazing people and connections. And so I do have inside routes to some of these. I also have connections at the UN, and they've got the FAO, their Food and Agricultural Organization. They get a couple of billion dollars a year, and they blow it in some of the most amazing ways. So if we can partner with them and, and get food facilities <coughs> put into place that just constantly run for decades at a time, then that basically is a much more efficient use of the funding. So yes, I, I have contacts. Right now I'm in phase one. We're doing a grow light development. Right now the average power consumption for a grow light is 100 to 500 watts, depending upon what you get. That cannot work if you're trying to go solar and wind power because that's just way too much energy being sucked by these lights. So I've developed a 20 watt system that I'm testing right now, and uh, once that is up and running and I made the adjustments that I need to make, then I know that I can do this off the grid, because for me it's all about off the grid. I can't jack into the existing system, because that just makes me dependent on the existing system. So once I get through that, then I'm going to build a full scale prototype. That's actually a lot easier than developing the light, because a lot of the techno all the technologies in the prototype system in these buildings exist today. They're just for, they're used for different applications. So I, that's the systems engineer in me is going to take all these different concepts, put them together under one roof, and we have a salad factory. That's what I call it, a salad factory. <laughs> yes. Uh, I would like to a short comment about uh, the transition also, because uh, we have all the cap capabilities now, we have all the knowledge, and uh, the problem is that our current system is uh, is not uh, it will not be able to exist if we, uh, exact, for example, have uh, abundance of electricity and we would make it of our own. We have the we have the possibility to do it. We we'll have uh, have Stirling engines uh, that can do uh, a lot more power. But the problem is that our our whole system is uh, is based on the taxes and income from from these things that we want to transist. Transition away from. from. Yeah. So we will uh, experience a co total welfare collapse and the collapse of our state if we if we in, uh, if we took it in. If we produce our own energy, think about how many money the government gets in green taxes on our energy bills. You mm -hmm. just look again the energy bills and then and then times that with five million for your neighbors. So it's a uh, it's. That's why the, our, our government say we want green energy. But on the other side, they also know that we want green energy, but only if we can get you to pay for it. You're not allowed to do it yourself. Because if you do it yourself, we cannot tax you. No. And the same with, uh, now they have a nice thing with uh, our electric cars. 
and they have zero uh, import tax on electric cars. But uh, today in the newspaper I just read that the uh, government is losing millions, or well, not billions, billions on the registration of cars because uh, a lot of new folks. So think if everybody, if they really want us to drive electric cars, then they will have zero income on the And that's income. why that's so why in the first world it's the first world is gonna be a lot more difficult to do some of these things, which is why I'm going third world first. Mm -hmm. I look at it this way. Africa has been the bastard child of the planet for long enough. I think Africa could be the savior of the planet if we do things the right way. And the people that are being screwed the most can be the ones that basically force the hand of the rest of the world. As far as I'm concerned, as Africa goes, <coughs> so goes the rest of the planet. And so if I can get in there and everybody can start saving lives, installing, upgrade, they don't have an infrastructure. So what is there to mess with? But eventually the people are going to go to their politicians and be like, you're done. You know, look what's going on down there. They have no energy bills, their, their, their life expectancies are going up, their educations are going up, all this other stuff. They live in a completely different world than we do on the same world. And if you guys want to keep fleecing, and then it comes that little uprising, the rabble, rabble, rabble. And I do not advocate violence or anything like that, but I think the system can be pressured to shift once <coughs> the people decide they want to. One second. Uh, coming back to the cars, in the city of Amsterdam, uh, we're now installing, uh, there's like free, there's electric cars that you can use for all over the city. You just get this pass, you hold it in front of the car, and then you can take it and drive anywhere. It's like the car share, right? Yeah. The car share yeah, and there's 400, 400 charging points in Amsterdam alone already, and they're going to go through the whole country. So in about three years in the Netherlands, you can pretty much charge your electric car wherever. And then there's an iPhone app and you can see where the nearest car is or where the nearest charge point is. And something that might be interesting for you as well, there's a university in the south of the country. Okay. They, have the, they have their own hydroponic system. Right. And they're testing lights at the moment. Mm -hmm. And they've just uh, developed a light which uses very little electricity. <coughs> it's perfect for these sort of vegetables. <coughs> and they're trying to create different lights for different sorts of vegetables. Right, maximizing the Yeah, efficiency. and they're doing that in cooperation with Philips. Right. But it might be something that's interesting for you as if well. If you get, back, get to me at the end of yes, this, and let me know who that is, and I'll write it down. We'll go back there, and then we'll go here. Right? Thanks for painting such a big, big, big vision of, of future development. I see, obviously, some of those changes in prior, like complete shift in thinking and, mm -hmm. and so on. But some <coughs> seem to be pretty straightforward, and just turning a, a windmill from vertical to horizontal. Why do you think that these say, rather simple measures that would still create profits for the company? So then somebody comes along with a vertical one, and people are like, whatever. You know, it, it, I don't know what the resistance is there, but they are just as, if not more efficient, they last longer, and things like that. So it would behoove people to pressure. <coughs> if they're going to build a window, build a whole bunch of vertical ones. And, and with the, these particular systems, you can do it with... Um, like little ones on every house, things like that. Uh, but the problem with that, and, and we we're alluding to it left and right, is that would destroy the energy money. I mean, if everybody got that independent. And that's a huge problem that we're going to have to overcome. And, and that's why it's an erosion pro process, and <laughs> not a you know instantaneous overthrow process, because that could be a lot worse for a lot more people. But yeah, we could, if people were to say, now let's don't do it that way anymore, do it this way. It takes up less land. Uh, people it, it give it a little aerodynamics one-on-one. -on -one. When the air goes through the blade on, a, on this, on a traditional fan, it comes out completely turbulent and messed up. And that's why you see these blades so far from each other. Because the wind has to kind of come back together to hit it the right way. Vertical doesn't have that problem. It goes like this and it vortexes wind up, but the wind can cut right through it and keep going. They can be closer together. It takes up less land. You don't need to have to, you don't have to take up so much space. You can pack them closer together. So there's a lot of benefits to it. So if people were to get, first, read up on it, get as educated about that as possible, the mass populace needs to do this, or some group, some organization can be founded to do that, and then use that as a lobbying force and say, stop doing it the dumb way. Start doing it this way, and here are the reasons why. 
And that's that's a way to get that ball rolling. If I can just, I, there's actually a bit of a problem with those windows. They have a very hard time sliding up by themselves. Which ones? The vertical ones. Not if they're on the mag labs. Not if they're on the magnetic bearings. Even on magnetic bearings, at least I've seen some small scale experiments uh, where they have ex like excellent um, energy output, but they couldn't get them to start up efficiently. How so small were they? This was, I think, a half meter or something. Okay. And the smaller ones are a little more difficult. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, you put a little women on top or whatever just to drive the first one. You got like a, kind of like a Kickstarter. That's kind of one of the arguments you get. Yeah. Okay. Yes. How, uh, how far are you from uh, getting the uh, totally greenhouse or food productions? Uh, for my company? Yeah. If things go according to the schedule, less than 12 months from as of three weeks ago. Is there, is there a web page where we can follow the process and see your programs? I, I haven't created a website yet because I'm only in phase one. I was going to wait till I got to phase two first because there really wasn't a lot to report. But I do have a Facebook page dedicated to the company and I give updates on there all the time. It's called Cybernated Farm Systems. So if you just search that in the, in Facebook, it'll pop right up. And that's why you keep in contact with you if you want to do programs like that and go and stuff like that. Yeah, there's uh if you if that information sheet that I'm that I can email you guys at the end will have my Facebook page, my email address, the CFS, my company's Facebook page, and different ways that you can follow and, and reach out to me and stuff like that as we go along. So if you want to stay in contact. And we have an email list over here so you can just write up your address if you want. Yeah. And and print it and like Capital letters so I can read it because I've already had <laughs> way too many bounce backs from people who probably really want yeah, people who really wanted the information but they were writing in cursive. And I'm like, I, first of all, half of it's Dutch or Norwegian or Swedish or whatever, I couldn't understand it. And then it's in cursive, which is uh, it's impossible to read anyway. So, anyway, just try to print it as neatly as possible and, uh, and you'll get that information. Yes? If you're in a really arid region, dry region, Won't a lot of water disappear from the system when you pick the vegetables? They only use recycle, right? Right, it recycles because it's aquaponic. There's actually it only uses one percent of the water that a traditional system would, but we're putting one hundred percent of the water in there that it would need. So, and not only that, you there are moisture extractors. <coughs> that you can put on these buildings there. Even, even if the humidity is low, there's still humidity in the air. And so you can extract moisture out of the air. Uh, and, and so there's, there's that capability. If it does rain, you can collect rain. Or else you have backup tanks built in too. And you know, if it ever got really weird and there was an entire decade where it just kept the water table kept going down in the system, well, I'll just bring in water and I'll fill it back up, no cost. I don't care, I'll just put more water in the system. Because I'm not out to fleece the people on additional costs and maintenance and all that. These buildings are a one-time cost and a one-time cost only. Everything else from that point forward is on me to make sure that it works as good as possible. That's what sustainability is supposed to be about. Not fleecing people on maintenance plans and constantly getting a dollar out of them every time something breaks. <coughs> Practice what you preach, right? Yes. What kind of waste would you expect from that uh, project you're having? From CFS? Yeah. The only waste that will come out of it at all will be a couple of dead fish every once in a while, and if there's an, a too, if we're growing too much food for the region, they'll have biomass, which isn't really waste because you can turn that into compost and then use that to fertilize the soil in the area so that their dead land becomes live land, and then they can grow wheats and grains and things like that, which really can't be done on the continent. So that's the only waste because it's all green, clean energy power, there's nothing else that goes into it. Basically, once you turn the building on, you don't need to touch it after that. Yes? Um, for the plants, uh, where does the nutrition come from? Okay. Come from? Uh, that's the, do you know how aquaponics works? No. No? no? Okay. Uh, for those who don't know what aquaponics is, it's hydroponics mixed with aqua aquaculture, which is basically a fish farm and a plant farm. The catch is that fish waste their pee and poo, whatever, dirty up the water. The plants actually want that. So you filter the dirty water to the plants and they suck the nutrients out of the water and that's how they get their food. <clears throat> then you run that through a gravel bed filtering system to add in more magnesiums and the metals and things like that, doing it the natural way, the way Earth intended. And then that cleans up the water and you run that clean water back into the fish tank. And so that's a closed loop system. Works just fine, that's how the Earth operates. 
Then you've got a secondary closed loop system. This is how you feed the fish. Tilapia, which is the fish we'll be using, feeds on a plant called duckweed. Duckweed grows in the water. So it's a water-based plant that can grow in the same ecosystem that the fish are in, and then they eat that, and that, and then the duckweed feeds off the fish waste too, so that's a closed loop system. So you've got two closed loop systems working together, so that's why you don't have to add anything to it once it's up and running. And uh, aquaponics is, is already a proven technical system. It's already, universities are doing it, so it works. And so what I'm doing is I'm kind of going industrial scale and adding tech and climate control and things like that so that these buildings can be put anywhere and not just out. Right now they all plug into the universities just plug everything into the outlets and they're running off the normal grid like everybody else. I'm taking it to that next level so it's independent. That's really the only difference. Yes? Um, I'm wondering about like uh, if you're aiming to go into to the third world as a starter, I'm thinking about the issues with the corruption and how would you ensure that the technology that you want to uh, deploy actually reaches the people that are actually starving and not the actual uh, top level of power and uh, money and so on that can actually pay for it. How do you ensure that? What are your thoughts on that? First, the geography. These things are literally going to be built two feet from where they live. So the, the food factory is going to be in the village. That's how portable is. these things are going to be built on site, which is local production, local distribution, and no logistics. When they want food, they got, when the building's got a harvest, it's got a little siren or whatever to go off. There's going to be a monitor that says, here's the harvest coming up tomorrow. They walk up, the conveyor belt turns on, uh, and out comes buckets of food. And then they just grab that, put it in their own buckets, and put it back in, and it cleans, it cleans everything on the inside. I can't predict the future as far as how people might try to corrupt or manipulate it. So... Yeah, they only going to grow hash. <laughs> but, uh, I look at it this way, if I'm getting the right kind of help from the right kind of people and putting these things in the right kinds of places, then it would be really kind of hard to mess with it because they're local. It's not like we're putting them in a city and then they got to ship it somewhere. So that it, cutting out a lot of the middleman, a lot of that ability to corrupt is taken out when that food factory is right in their own backyard. I think that goes a long way to mitigating a lot of those those things right off the bat. Yes? Yeah. Uh, I'm curious as to what you plan to do once you've allocated uh, the local work, the workforce and maintenance force, because it's a common problem that after that you educate someone and then they leave, because they're not educated so they can get a job and get paid and send money back home. Right. So then you end up with a broken facility. Well, we, we do, we're we going to have our own maintenance staff, too. So, I mean, just in case it ever gets to that point. But that would be how long down the road would that be from the building. We'd have to judge how fast that would happen if they do leave and try to go get jobs and come back. Because obviously, we are going to educate them. Now, these, these buildings are going to be modular so that, let's say, the entire village starts to dissipate and everybody starts moving into bigger cities or whatever. All right, well, we can just disassemble the whole building. It's like Legos. We can disassemble the whole building and move it and put it somewhere else. Uh, it's not like drivable. It's not on wheels or anything, but it will be modularized in a way that we can move it if we have to. So it's not like it's such a permanent facility that can't go anywhere. Another bonus of being off the grid. We don't have to plug in the plumbing and electrical and all that. It's its own animal, so you just undo it and move it. Yes? Um, do you have any plans of protecting the knowledge here, or is it uh, open source and licensed under Creative Commons or anything? I gotta play the game by the rules that exist a little bit, so I can really get in there and get these facilities where they need to be the most. Plus, I have other plans too, and I'm gonna need to fund them. So I have made this a straight up company. That it's gonna be a CSR company, so that we're gonna have cross checks with a like a nonprofit that's gonna be our check and balance like have 50% of the board of directors from a nonprofit who aren't employed by uh, Plantagon is, a, is a, an organization that has this set up. They have Plantagon the company and Plantagon the nonprofit. They don't employ the same people. The nonprofit is populated by volunteers and people who just get involved with the nonprofit. 10% of the, of the profits made by uh, Plantagon the company go to the nonprofit and the nonprofit controls 50% of the board of directors, they nominate the people for the corporation. 
And the charter is that, they, that the nonprofit makes sure that the company stays CSO, that it doesn't go crazy with profit hoarding or doing bad practices and that they are humane and they're going along with the charter states. I'm going to have a very similar setup so that I am forced to stay. Of course, I'm not worried about me, but that I'm going to check and balance. But I am using the profits. The reason why I'm not making this creative comment yet, might later on, but yet, is because I do want to bring in a lot of resources, a lot of finance, because I have other things I want to do. I have an energy program that I want to develop, but I've got to have the funding to do that. And so I'm using that to feed other things, other projects. So, so, so are you protecting it with patents or? Yes. Yes, yeah. okay. Yep. I'm going to have all that too. There's not a whole lot I'm going to patent directly, but I mean, people could copy it once they figure out how it works, and I actually I really don't care too much because the more these facilities are out there, the more people are getting fed. As far as I'm concerned, that's a okay. win. Yes. Okay, I thought you were creating a kind of uh, sophisticated uh, communism. <laughs> <laughs> that's not. So, what do you mean what? sophisticated communism? Well, uh, when I'm working uh, with people. Uh, Oh, I'm an architect, and, uh, and I'm working in a sphere where people tell me, oh, what you say, uh, that's communism. Because uh, they are taking, uh, some people are taking some of the market. Mm -hmm. You know, you, uh, it, it depends that, uh, how, how smart are you to, to get this uh, share of the market. Right. I mean, and, uh, that's the game we play now, right? Yes. So we've gotta, I've got to play by the rules that exist with the yes. intent on changing the rules. Yes. <coughs> yeah. But uh, the end, uh, the goal uh, in the end is... In the long run, is to drive myself out of business. Uh, sophisticated communism. I guess. There's uh, so many people that don't like this word, communism. But, uh, but they love the word community. But it, I, I, I find it... Uh, <laughs> It is a necessity you're talking about. You have to go another way in, in the market way. Right, and, and to, I mean, we don't really need in the market if you have abundance, because abundance makes markets pointless. So that's where you erode the system from the current level of thinking. I mean, I guess you could say sophisticated communism. I mean, we're all, gonna live, we're all part of communities, which is where that word comes from in the first place. And we're all social creatures, which then that's where you get your socialism. So it's funny how these words have been bastardized in different ways. I do think both communism and socialism and all the old school isms are old ways of thinking based on the times that they were developed, but we're in a, a completely different kind of world. Um, but it's got a little bit of everything. It's got democracy built into this system too, because people will come together and form collaborative groups if there's a problem and they will work together towards solving it. I mean, the scientific process by itself is highly democratic. Because no one scientist dictates to everybody, this is how physics is going to work. A bunch of scientists come together and they do research and experiments, and they collaborate and they share data, and then they develop the formulas or the principles. That's how physics works. So that's more democratic than most people realize. And so that's the kind of social evolution that we're moving towards. Yes? I was wondering, uh, on this new world that you are... As long as you didn't say order. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> which, you, uh, which you say is uh, necessary and uh, to overcome the new problems. But I, uh, I'm, I might be a skeptic uh, or a, a bit of a pessimist because I'm, I, I think people are underestimating the impact of the coming climate uh, catastrophe. Uh, which will uh, ruin almost a lot of what we have built and what we have been become used to, but, uh, both from food supplies, water supplies, stable uh, weather uh, in uh, many parts of the world. Uh, really horrible storms are ruining all uh, phases of, of normal living. I agree. It will come to Europe as well. I agree. Harsh. Winters uh, like the, those we had uh, last year and the year before will become uh, normal, and uh, as well as uh, drought right. in many parts of the world. And uh, this will trigger uh, really uh, massive social unrest, which I think will be a very big barrier for the collaboration and knowledge sharing and uh, all other things that 
will be the basis of the world you are uh, asking for, and which uh, I think many of us <coughs> find very uh, <coughs> attractive uh, thought. Right. At, at right. So what is your response to this? We better haul ass and move as fast as we can to, get, to stop it. I mean, really, it's a speed issue, isn't it? I mean, if we keep doing what we're doing, then we're just going to kill ourselves. And it's coming. But the, the only solution to that is to move as fast as we possibly can to change things, to erode the system and bring about something where people want to work together, they're not ordered to work together, to where they are less dependent on the system so they can affect positive change. Um, I can't predict the future, and I don't know when the global climate issue is going to get a tipping point that's just, you know, no way back. I don't necessarily believe in no way back anyway. Uh, Nature finds a way of rebalancing itself, and, and we might have to adjust accordingly. Yeah, but Earth was not built <coughs> for man. Oh, I know. <laughs> we're, we're temporary <laughs> custodians. Yeah. Yeah. And the the dinosaurs, they thought they were here for a while, too. And I just think too many people are underestimating this uh, when they are thinking. Also, Peter Diamandis, the guy... Yeah, the founder, I actually know Peter. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I thought so, because he talked about him. Talk, talk like him. Uh, and he's also talking about this abundance, and uh, yeah. but there will not. I, I'm just saying there will not be abundance if everybody is fighting just to keep themselves alive. I know, and like I said, headed off in the past. We just got to do what we can. I, what we can't do is get bogged down in the pessimism that causes us to be depressed <coughs> and do nothing. Because if we do nothing, then we're definitely going to be swimming in the sea. Yes. Uh, I just want to add the comments to that uh, question uh, because. I just, um, I don't know if it's different here in, uh, in Denmark than it is in Sweden where I live, but it, normally people don't talk to each other when they're like on a bus or on a train, unless the train stops. When there's something wrong, what, what the fuck is going on, what's happening? <laughs> people start talking and, and communicating and maybe they, they need some new friends. Uh, at least they start talking, what, what options do we have, what, how can we solve this? Right. Same thing will be for the society. I mean, we're, we are a great example of that. We're here for a, a reason. We notice that some of the things that we're used to won't be working when there will be no oil anymore. Or, you know what I'm talking about. We're looking here for different options, alternatives. Same thing as in the rest of society. As, as people will notice uh, that, that what they're used to will not work anymore, they will start looking around like, what options are there? What can we do to, uh, to improve our, our situation again? And we have a responsibility here because we know of some alternatives that are not publicly available yet because people don't know about this. We do. So, I mean, what can we do? We can, we can share this information. That's, that's a great start, I think. Great. All right, I'll do one more because we can seriously be here for four hours. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm not good at questions also, so I was about to comment because uh, this is also very, very important and also why Douglas is, is also promoting all these good new ideas and for some it, it feels like utopia but for, for many of us it is something we have to work towards because I think also we are going to head for big problems in the near future, weather-wise, uh, migration-wise, uh, starvation and all these kind of things, but if we hit if we uh, hit this big and there will be problems, then we have to also try and, and things collapse. Then we have to also be enough people saying, okay, we want to restart the old stuff and try to do it all again the same monetary system, uh, all that making uh, things break before time, or do we want to? Now we have the chance to start up again. Then we can make a better, better world. So, and also we have to we have to hope we are not at the tipping point, and try to fix things now, and not uh, not we cannot just sit down and say, oh, it's too late or I I cannot do anything. Of course you can do it. Everybody can do it. I, I part I usually part. This is sometimes in the middle of my lecture, but I'll leave it at the end. Something to think about. If you talk about this to other people, they throw out the notions of you know that's crazy. That's never going to happen. Uh, they can't wrap their head around it, right? Because they're so well conditioned to accept what they've been told from the time they were born. I mean, God, you start learning math using money and stuff like that. It's in books. It's in kids' books. I mean, it's, it's put in there right at the beginning. Go back 50,000 years and try to explain to a hunter-gatherer indoor plumbing. 
They have no reference. They have no understanding. And they're going to think you're talking about some utopian ideal. Wait, you mean I can turn on a tap and I can get hot or cold water anytime I want and I don't have to go anywhere? Look, I've carried a bucket to the creek. My dad carried a bucket to the creek. My grandfather carried a bucket to the creek. We're always going to carry buckets to the creek. Don't let those people, that thought process, stop in North Carolina. <laughs> <Thanks. laughs>